<clears throat> hey everyone, this is uh, Ahmed Farag. I'm one of the R3s at the University of Kentucky. Tommy Ann and I are the um, communications co-chairs and we um, put on these webinars. Today we have a uh, great webinar with uh, Dr. Baxter and I'm going to let uh, Anderson Webb kind of introduce him. Hey, so I'm Anderson Webb. Thanks everybody for being here. I'm an R1 at University of Chicago. And uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Baxter to you. I'm excited about his presentation today. Um, Dr. Baxter, he did his medical school and diagnostic radiology residency at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He then did his interventional neuroradiology fellowship at the University of Western Ontario and Dalhousie University, also both in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And uh, he's currently working to develop stroke programs in Allentown, Pennsylvania and Sioux Falls, North Dakota. And in the past, he's been chief and chair of the Department of Radiology at Erlanger Health System in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is where I met him during medical school. Um, Erlanger is uh, the Southeast Regional Stroke Center. It's uh, very well known in the area and, and outside of the area as well. Um, Dr. Baxter has been the past president of the Society of Neurointerventional Surgery. He's held steering committee membership on the Don trial, and he currently holds multiple consulting appointments, uh, including with Viz AI. So we, uh, it's our privilege then to hear from him today, and I'm excited to see his presentation. Yeah, well, thanks, Anderson, uh, very much for that uh, very kind intro. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, whoever's uh, tuning in this evening. And I was going to spend a little time talking about, um, you know, stroke care. Obviously, uh, focusing in on the endovascular uh, part of stroke care, but specifically looking at something a little trendy, which is kind of the impact that artificial intelligence is having on how we're delivering and organizing uh, stroke care. So these are my disclosures, as Anderson was saying. I've been involved in a lot of, uh, you know, kind of uh, developing, uh, you know, kind of not only the techniques in this care, but but helping to organize the systems of care. And I think, you know, pretty much everyone is familiar that um, the standard of care for the acute stroke uh, patient subset that has a large vessel occlusion uh, changed back in 2015 with mechanical thrombectomy becoming uh, the new standard of care uh, for these patients, which was a great thing. And and for those of you that, um, you know, kind of probably haven't been involved or actually seen a, a you know, stroke patient come in uh, and then get this kind of therapy, I thought I'd just start, you know, because obviously in all of medicine, the main focus is on kind of what we do and, and the patients and, and, uh, and the therapies and hopefully the, uh, the great outcomes that we offer them. So, so here's a young patient coming in and, and unfortunately, uh, in Chattanooga, we did have a very high stroke um, uh, population and incidence, uh, often even young patients. As you can see, this is a young 32-year-old uh, mother of three who's in the middle of having a big stroke. So um, here she is on presentation. Can you tell me your name? Can you tell me your name? Just look at me for one second. You look here and just follow my finger with your eyes, okay? So she's aphasic. She has a gaze preference. She forced eye deviation, looking to the uh, to the left. Okay. All right. Can you raise your arms in the air? Raise your hands in the air, okay? All right. Can you raise this, this hand over here? Raise this hand for me. Okay. That's good. How about raising this hand? Can you raise this one for me? Completely paralyzed on the right. Raise in the air, okay? Okay. Let's get your legs. How about your legs? Can you raise your legs for me? That's good. Raise the other one for me, okay? Can you raise this one? Okay, man, we're going to get you fixed up, okay? So really before, um, you know, mechanical thrombectomy was a viable option for this type of patient, uh, especially in young patients, you know, the mortality rate, not, not, only the more morbidity rate, but mortality rate would be pretty high, especially these young patients who would get a lot of uh, cerebral edema and herniate. So um, obviously very devastating stroke. I mean, at best, you know, this, this uh, young patient's going to be left aphasic and, and hemiparetic. Uh, thankfully, um, you know, the, the thrombectomy procedures, uh, we could now quickly recanalize these occluded vessels. 
so here's this little nugget of, of clot that we vacuumed out with, I say we have clot pluckers and clot suckers. This is one of the uh, clot suckers, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a suction aspiration catheter that we can navigate all to the M, uh, all the way to the M1. Um, so a very quick recanalization procedure for her, all done, obviously, you know, kind of from a catheter-based approach. Um, and then here she is on the angio table, about five minutes post opening up the occluded M1 vessel. And you can see it's actually medically almost like witnessing a miracle where you can see the brain uh, just having its blood supply restored. And you can see how she's resolving her clinical symptoms uh, literally within minutes of having the vessel open. Hey man, can you tell me your name? Can you talk to me? It's every. Oh, hey. Great. Where where are you? Do you know where you are? Oh. Do you know the name of this hospital? Let's see. No. Do you know what happened to you this morning? No. Okay. All right. Just look over here, okay, ma'am? Okay. Can you look way over here? Okay. Great. Do you know what today is? What's today? Okay. Yeah. All right. Hey, ma'am, let's get you to raise your arms right up in the air. Okay, raise both of them. Reach for the sky. Okay, get them both up there. Way, 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 way up. Okay. Okay, bring them close together. Okay. That's good. Okay, raise those arms. That's great. Okay. Great. You can put your arms down now, ma'am. Okay. And let's get you to raise your legs. Okay. Hang on one sec. Just get one covered here for a sec. All righty. Okay. Can you? Raise those legs, great, that's good. Raise your leg, that's perfect, okay. That's great, ma'am, okay. Okay, you had a stroke this morning, okay? So we're gonna get you upstairs and get you to look at me, okay? Okay. So you can see that um, it's pretty miraculous uh, that you, know, you get to witness something like that and see that patient walk out of the, the hospital door about 72 hours uh, perfectly intact. And so um, fortunately, you know, a number of treaters, uh, we got together and in 2015, there were uh, five uh, major, you know, uh, international trials that all showed, um, you know, the, the strong, you know, uh, treatment effect of mechanical thrombectomy. These were kind of the landmark randomized control trials that were done. And uh, they were kind of referred to as the, the big five. They were all New England Journal of Medicine uh, published, uh, you know, uh, uh, trials. And uh, what, we, what we uncovered was really one of the strongest treatment effects in medical history. Uh, the number needed to treat for these patients is anywhere from 2.5 to 4 to achieve uh, an MRS of 0 to 2. And that, that's a good functional outcome. And that we consider that that the patient is um, able to live independently, um, you know. And so, um, you know, by way of comparison, if you take STEMI, uh, their number needed to treat is uh, anywhere from 16 to 20 range. So it's a it's a much 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 stronger uh, treatment effect. And so obviously this is what shifted things and made it standard of care. Uh, the when those five New England Journal of Medicine uh, trials were published, uh, the AHA reflected, um, you know, the, what had changed in the stroke treatment, you know, by their guidelines. Uh, but they did put um, this six hour from symptom onset for triaging and treating these patients. And so, um, you know, we were by inclusion criteria in those trials, getting people very early from symptom onset. And uh, so, you know, six hours was put into the guidelines uh, and we, we'd always functioned under this, you know, premise that time is brain. Um, obviously, when these vessels are occluded, you want to try to be as close to symptom onset as possible. Um, we, you know, knew all the, the, the science, so to speak, that, you know, the longer you wait to reperfuse the occluded uh, area, uh, the, the less likely the patient would have a good clinical outcome. So those were all kind of things that were, were known to us. But we began to, to wonder, you know, is, is time really everything? In other words, should we put this hard stop on just screening patients out to six hours from their symptom onset? Because what we observed when we were looking and doing, you know, kind of this trial work and, and some early trial work, uh, th this was findings we found 
in, an, in an MRI study that was looking at basically how people grow their infarcts over time, the DIFFUSE-2 trial, we, we found that there was high variability in, in how long it takes someone to complete an infarct, if you like, in the MCA territory, you know, once the vessel's occluded. If you look at this patient, uh, they're about 11 hours from their symptom onset, uh, but you can see that they have a relatively low core infarct volume, even 11 hours out. So they're kind of this, you know, slowly growing this MCA infarct um, over a long period of time versus uh, another patient who's about four hours from symptom onset. And you can see that basically uh, they've essentially infarcted the entire MCA territory, um, even though they're within a six hour from, you know, window from, from symptom onset, but the whole MCA is kind of is kind of wiped out. So this variability, you know, we kind of began to think of patients as, hey, you know, are they slow infarctors, fast infarctors? And um, I'll show you here are kind of four different patients who all are the same time from having their M1 occluded, but there's you know, varying ways that they're presenting. So this patient has a relatively low stroke scale score of five, um, a pretty good aspect score. So we look at their non-con CT and we see that there's a, a small burden of core infarct and then a, a, a relatively small area of penumbral tissue adjacent to that core infarct, but, but a kind of a small mismatch from the core infarct to the uh, penumbral area. Uh, versus this patient who has a very large stroke scale score, uh, we look at them, they, they sort of have that same small core infarct, but there's a very large penumbral area, and they have what we would call a very large you know, core to penumbral mismatch. Um, if we look at this patient, they have a pretty big stroke scale score, uh, we see that they have a pretty sizable um, infarct already, core infarct. Uh, there is some adjacent penumbral tissue, but it's again, you know, a, a relatively small mismatch compared to the, the previous patient that we just showed. And then there's this patient that has, again, a large stroke scale score. Um, essentially, it's all core infarct, and there's really no mismatch at all. It's a complete match defect. So, so what's the difference? Well, the difference between these four patients all presenting, you know, the same time from the onset of their symptoms is their collateral strength. So these patients are highly collateral dependent. Um, you know, this patient has very, very, very good collaterals. And these were the type of patients that we were looking for when we were doing these, you know, trial work with somebody that could essentially with their M1 occluded could tread water for quite a long time and have a lot of salvageable brain with very little, you know, permanently damaged brain when we got to, uh, you know, treatment of mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, these people on the gray zone, so to speak, that have sort of, they still have a mismatch. If we let them go longer in time, they would grow their core infarct to completely match that penumbral area, um, but they have less, if you like, salvageable tissue at the time of treatment. Uh, versus this patient who's someone we really don't want to treat, even if they were a couple hours from symptom onset, because they have a complete match. Like it's, it's all dead brain. The entire MCA territory has already been infarcted and there's really no salvageable tissue to kind of go after. So um, like I said, the, the difference in these patients is collaterals. If you look on the left, is kind of the normal situation. On the right, uh, when you occlude that M1 segment, um, we see that downstream, the patient is actually getting blood supply. So how's that happening? Well, it's happening through blood being diverted, obviously, you know, kind of up the ACA. And then these people open up this peel collateral network, and then they backfill uh, the downstream MCA branches to the level of the, the clot. So that collateral is what's buying you time. And, uh, you know, the time is brain. Uh, you know, sort of adage that we worked under is really an oversimplified concept. There's, as we've just shown, there's, you know, collateral flow is an important thing. Uh, there's many other factors that get kicked into play when, when your vessel's occluded uh, that make you fit into these categories of kind of this fast infarctor versus a slow infarctor. So if you look at this patient, you know, just to kind of uh, underscore with a, a couple of case scenarios, here's someone that's two hours from symptom onset. And you can see 
that uh, the core infarct here in magenta and the penumbra are pretty matched. So this is uh, early time from symptom onset, but they have poor collaterals. They're gonna have a poor outcome because they were a fast infarctor versus this patient who's 16 hours from symptom onset and they have a, a small core infarct burden relative to the penumbral area that's a jeopardy. And so this patient, they're a late time, like uh, if we followed the 2015 AHA guidelines, we would say, hey, they're later than six hours, we shouldn't treat them. Uh, but this patient, uh, late time, but they have great collaterals. So they would still have a good outcome if we treat them with mechanical thrombectomies so, because they're a slow infarctor. So we did some trial work uh, that got published in 2018 for these late presenting people beyond six hours. And, and this allowed us to basically select and, and you know, kind of treat patients up to 24 hours. And I know most of you are pretty familiar with all that, but, it, but it is, it's been a time of rethinking the whole, you know, not just looking at the clock, the time is brain, but also you know, kind of coining that, um, even the you know, neurologist here, that Dr. Gomez, that, that coined the time as brain. Um, after those 2018 you know, trials were, were released, he said basically it's, you know, um, it, it is more important to look at the tissue and how much salvageable tissue there is for a patient rather than just look at the clock and rethink this that tissue is brain uh, rather than just time is brain. So in 2018, when the Dawn trial and Diffuse 3 trials were, were published, um, it, like I said, it did have AHA go back and redo the guidelines to allow us to uh, screen people up to 24 hours. And as we know, um, you know, the, the, this has caused a lot of uh, reorganizing, you know, kind of how we um, try to identify these patients. Uh, Imaging-based patient selection is very important. Everyone has been looking at, okay, this is a time-sensitive therapy. You know, we, we've got to move quickly to, to recanalize these occluded vessels. Um, you know, so, so there's been a lot of work on these stroke systems of care. And uh, before stroke, you know, didn't really have this time, uh, you know, e efficient, you know, therapy. And so, you know, the things weren't, you know, in a well-oiled machine to get these patients in as quickly and on the angio table as, as possible. So we kind of took other, um, you know, um, models from other medical worlds that were, you know, dealing with time-sensitive therapies. If you look at the trauma world, I mean, they had this figured out for years where they had a, a very standardized triage criteria where they'd identify patients based on that severity. You know, the patient got transported, you know, to either level one, level two or level three, you know, trauma center where they received the appropriate level of care. You know, none of that was really in play or in place for stroke. So we had a lot of work to do on every one of those elements, the triage, uh, you know, transporting people and getting them to the uh, correct treatment centers. So really the holy grail of all of this starts at the beginning with recognizing, okay, who is that large vessel occlu occlusion stroke patient that is on this time urgent pathway that we need to get to the correct center. So triage is at the key, uh, at the heart of it all. And so, um, you know, recognizing that at the EMS level is really, really important. And for, um, you know, for EMS providers to recognize these emergent large vessel occlusion patients or elvo patients is often difficult. It's kind of like, you know, that saying it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Because if you look at those EMS providers um, in all of the calls that they encounter in a year, they probably only encounter one true positive large vessel occlusion patient per year. So for them to be, you know, like have at their fingertips all of these, you know, kind of stroke screening tools and all that kind of stuff for that one patient per year, um, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to get them prepared and trained. And so we've been using technology to help them. As you all know, there's uh, a, a number of now large vessel occlusion uh, specific stroke screening uh, scores that are available. So we've put them on um, apps so these EMS providers can have them at their fingertips. And if they, you know, in their area, if they're using, say, a LAM score, race score, these kind of things, they can just call that up. They don't have to memorize all these. Uh, they can just input the, the patient's clinical information. 
Um, it walks them through, and then at the end it says, hey, as in this case, the results are likely um, a large vessel occlusion stroke patient, and then they know, okay, we need to go to a center where you know they, they treat large vessel occlusion stroke patients. Um, but to take this up a notch, this is kind of the whole purpose of the talk, was really how um, AI has kind of not just futuristically, but in the present, has really you know kicked this uh, identification into kind of warp speed. I kind of borrowed from Star Wars here to, to say you know this is not like in uh, you know in a galaxy far off. It's kind of happening presently in uh, in, in stroke care, or that people are are of course all over you know using uh, say facial recognition for um, you know uh, how to analyze patterns, um, you know, kind of gain information. We know all the big players, Facebook, everyone is, is you know, kind of using, uh, you know, facial recognition and AI. Uh, so this is also the case, uh, you know, kind of uh, with, with stroke, you know, patients. Everyone obviously has access to smartphone technology. And so a nice platform utilizing AI is this one that's coming out of Israel. And this is a CVAID which is uh, primarily focused on basically doing a digital stroke scale score. So uh, a trained provider, e either EMS or a nurse, uh, can just video the patient and they're gonna put them through a, a battery of modified tests. They don't put them through uh, the exact equivalent of the whole stroke scale score, but they put the patient through testing. Uh, this gets uploaded to the cloud. The AI is analyzing you know, kind of the muscle facial weakness patterns, the the arm weakness patterns, the speech disturbance patterns, and the AI can learn and correlate. You know, what is highly predictive of stroke, and so it can it can basically you know differentiate and say, hey, this is very likely this muscle facial weakness pattern to be um, you know predictive of stroke. And so here's kind of you know taking a look at how that's inputted. They put in the patient's uh, demographics and some identifying information. Um, then they're walked through basically, like I said, kind of, uh, you know, uh, various elements of the stroke score. Uh, so this would be, you know, kind of, you know, asking some simple questions. What year is it? Where are we now? And then uh, getting the patient to do some simple tasks like smiling, showing their teeth. Again, look at these muscle facial weakness patterns, uh, looking at, you know, uh, can they raise both arms? Is there any weakness of an arm relative to the other side? Um, and then all this information is uploaded, like I said, to the cloud. And then you get your uh, analysis from the, the AI to say, yes, this, you know, kind of is, uh, is predictive and in keeping with stroke. And then it spits out basically this digital stroke scale score. The team is notified. And uh, they can also watch the video, you know, to, to see the accuracy and uh, of, of the assessment. And, and, but it gives you a very good way to tap in. So you can imagine, um, you know, family members even that could just use their smartphone. Someone could walk, you know, uh, uh, this patient, you know, um, pro, you know the, walk the family member to, you know, through this testing, you know, kind of virtually. And then you can basically beam in and get almost immediate access to see, you know, kind of what the condition of this patient is. So this is, uh, I think, going to help a lot in uh, triage world. Um, you can imagine, I know that some of you are places where they're using, like, say, um, you know, kind of uh, CT scanners and, and stroke ambulances. Um, you know, the, one of the things is trying to get those expensive, valuable resources to the true positives. And so if, if this exam was done, uh, and you know, hey, this is highly likely that this is a true positive large vessel occlusion. That's where the, uh, the you know, the stroke ambulance needs to go. Uh, then that that really helps in dis dispatching those resources in a wise way. Uh, the next step is obviously then just confirming through imaging, like we talked about, that this is a true positive large vessel occlusion. And so there's some um, uh, AI platforms that have been very helpful in confirming those true positives. Uh, there's sort of competitors, uh, VizAI and uh, SchemaView, which has a, what they call the rapid uh, platform. And both of these are, are, you know, kind of very advanced in what they're doing with, with their AI technologies. If you look at rapid, that was probably the most used. It was used in, um, you know, several of our clinical trials. 
for uh, you know screening patients and the patient inclusion. Um, it's uh, you know FDA thrombectomy indicated, and uh, it has AI platforms that um, you know uh, you scan the patient. You basically do the non-con CT, the CTA, and it generates a CT perfusion. Um, it's going to read the CTA for you, looking for that M1 or M2. So the AI. You know, uh, thousands and thousands of, of uh, you know, true positive CTAs have been put in. The AI learns what to look for for those occlusions. And so, um, you know, it'll read the CTA saying, I hey, hate there's an M1 or there's an M2 or an M3 occlusion. Uh, it, it can also generate an automated aspect score from the non con CT. And then it's also a new platform that's kind of uh, fairly recent is looking on the hemorrhagic side to, um, you know, kind of recognize and, and grade the uh, ICHs. Um, and obviously, this is happening very quickly. The patient's scanned. You do, um, you know, kind of the, the, the CTA, CTP protocol within minutes, you know, less than five minutes. Uh, the software has analyzed this. Again, it's uploaded in the cloud. Software analyzes it, and it spits out this information. If you look, say, Viz AI, at the CTA recognition piece, um, it's got a sensitivity of around 90%, specificity 82.5%. If you compare sensitivities, uh, you know, uh, neuroradiology trained uh, readers are hovering at 75 to 80%, uh, diagnostic uh, radiologists hovering around 50 to 55%. So, you know, already the CTA is very sensitive in picking up the large vessel occlusions. Uh, so, within minutes, um, of scan time, you know, you know, the whole team that's on call for stroke, uh, you know, can get access to this information. That the ways it's displayed are very nice. I mean, there's apps, obviously, so you can get a uh, look at all the imaging on your your smartphone, uh, your Apple Watch. So, in other words, you're not limited to uh, you know pushing stuff around on on packs and uh, systems talking to each other. You get this, you know, kind of from the software. So here's on my phone, uh, just uh, excuse my poor videoing, but just showing you how easy, like uh, you know, with Viz AI, if I just open it up, this was a demo case, but I would get alerted, say it's a Saturday morning, I'm gonna you know, hop on my bike, all of a sudden I get this alert that there's a patient in the scanner. So this is uh, what would come up, would be this suspected elbow um, identified, so you just open it up and this, the patient is literally just minutes from being scanned, they're still on the table. I've got access, whether that's in my, my mothership hospital or that's in a hospital 100 miles away. I don't have to have things pushed over packs. I can just look at the non-con CT, the CTA, the CTP at my fingertip. I confirm that yes, this indeed does look like a true large vessel occlusion, I can assess on the CT perfusion whether they're a good candidate, as we've talked about um, you know, kind of earlier with the uh, mismatch between the core and the penumbral area. I can communicate with everyone on the team, hey, it looks like we have a true positive patient, um, either in a referral hospital, you know, network hospital to, to get them sent in. The whole team can be uh, you know, getting this information you know, very easily. And so it's a very nice way to uh, speed up the recognition and the throughput of patients. So when you implement those, this is uh, my experience when I was at Erlanger, you know, we aim for certain goals uh, for the stroke patient workflow. Uh, we like the door to imaging to be about 10 minutes. Uh, we wanted to get the, from the CT pictures to puncture to be about 60 minutes. Uh, so obviously that would give you a door to puncture of about 70 minutes. We were always uh, hovering a little north of 80 minutes, and uh, we want to try to get the imaging to revascularization done within 90 minutes. Uh, when we put in and implemented uh, Viz AI, it uh, cut our door to puncture time almost in half, and that was really because you cut out a lot of these steps. In other words, you know, okay, hey, you know, patient scanned, you know, who's got to read that at two in the morning? We got to get an answer back that it's a large vessel occlusion before anything moves forward. You know, it's so. So having the automation of that information and having it uh, within minutes of the scan time 
uh, really, really, really sped up, like I said, incredibly the, uh, the workflow and getting that patient identified as someone we needed to treat and the, uh, the, the treatment done. Uh, so it, it not only speeds things up, you know, but more importantly, when you do speed things up, if you looked at even how rapid helped in the trials that were done, the trials that used that type of technology to um, identify and select patients, uh, actually those trials showed the most absolute benefit uh, in, in good patient outcomes. So, so it, that's the part of the equation that we want to make sure really um, does improve as well, is that if you do things quickly, you obviously hope that tra that translates into, a, you know, a more improved or better outcomes for the patients. And so uh, it, it did, it was, uh, it correlated that way. And so uh, I think the final frontier, just kind of in winding down before I open this up to, um, to questions is really, something that's uh, been excited, exciting and, and is actually happening. I've been waiting for the day when, when I sort of get replaced by this guy. And so, uh, you know, uh, the, the actual you know, robot doing the procedure is, is happening as well. Uh, here were uh, a tweet that happened uh, this, this past winter uh, from some colleagues up at Toronto Western uh, in Toronto where they were doing the first uh, robotic neuro interventions. Uh, they coiled this um, uh, posterior circulation SCA aneurysm uh, robotically. And so uh, stroke uh, cases have actually now been done as well, that uh, people are doing them remotely uh, via the robot. And so uh, that, that also will be uh, brought into uh, to our world. So it's not futuristic, but it's actually uh, here. And some of you may be at centers where that's actually happening now. And, and uh, so it's, it's pretty exciting from that. That regard, and I'm doing work in, as Anderson mentioned, in uh, South Dakota. There's obviously places that have uh, geographic needs and, and uh, big distances to try to uh, transport patients to get treatment. So uh, robotic treatment is something that could really help and impact in, in that kind of a scenario. And so uh, here I am with my family. You can see I'm fully into my uh, transformation into into that robotic world. So for you Westworld fans. I'll uh, close with this and, and open it up for any uh, any questions. So, so thanks for your attention. Any uh, any questions or? Yeah, yeah, I have one. Um, so I, one of my questions, uh, you kind of may have answered at the end, but maybe you can elaborate. I was, it seems like a lot of uh, what we're working towards is moving the patient to the treatment not so much the treatment to the patient, but that last bit about the robotic procedures, uh, that seems to be moving the treatment to the patient. How how far off do you think something like that is to improving so, access I mean, in these rural areas? So, so I think, uh, you know, obviously the capabilities are there. The robot is uh, performing very, very well, uh, actually uh, surpassing people's, you know, kind of expectation of, of how well it can perform. And so um, I think we're just a uh, couple of years from, you know, like, you know, probably implementation of uh, putting that in areas. So, so I'll use, um, you know, uh, obviously I'm in South Dakota, but really in the U.S., if you look at a map, um, you know, like you said, you know, moving the patient, you know, you could either through fixed wing or certainly with helicopter, shuttle a lot of people around, and and uh, there's been you know different debates going on about workforce and stuff and how close people are, but but most people in the population in the U.S. are within certainly a, a couple hours of of getting someone by air you know to uh, to a treatment center. So um, you know there's just a few places that have those big geographies. Um, you know, maybe Alaska, that kind of thing. But yeah, if you look in, you know, a place like Canada, Russia, these places that have huge, huge distances, um, you know, it, it may make sense to, you know, obviously implement, uh, you know, robotic stuff, you know, kind of if someone's a thousand miles away, you know, and you can do the procedure, you know, kind of remotely, uh, you know, that that may be the way that to, to, to develop it. But, it, but it's, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, in development right now, uh, people, you know, like are, are doing the procedures and then it will just be a matter. I think it's a little bit, um, you know, the, the medical legal side of it. 
um, you know, what happens if there's complications. Some of these things are the, the things that are holding it back more than the technology, you know, just trying to, fit, you know, work through, uh, you know, those issues. Anybody at a center where, um, where you have that robotic, uh, you know, in the test phase? No, unfortunately not. Has um, has your view on that changed uh, in the last few years? Like, has it been rapid progress, or, or uh, yeah, it no, seems it's, to it's be really, pretty? Uh, yeah, it's it, it. Like my view has changed. I, I really was skeptical about it. I didn't think, um, you know, kind of the uh, if you like, you know, there's there's so much as you guys know. That are you know kind of thinking of doing procedural work or in that you know sort of uh, you know that, that learning and training phase, you, you know there's so much um, uh, manual feedback and stuff that you think okay there's no way that could be you know kind of replicated with a, a robot, but uh, but actually um, you know it's there there's things that the robot is is doing much better you know at doing like sort of uh, you know you can uh, you know sort of uh, uh, have the robot, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, for wire selecting of vessels and stuff, you know, you can make uh, extremely precise, you know, type of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, um, ways that the robot does that, that, that's actually probably better than what we're doing from a human point of view. So, so I, I, I've been, become a believer. I, I was skeptical at first, but definitely I think that their the technology is, is um, you know, very, very impressive. So if anyone wants to ask a question, just raise your hand. I see that uh, Charlotte has raised her hand, followed by uh, Ray. So Charlotte, we'll let you ask your question, then go to Ray. And then uh, I think Hassan and Jacob also had some questions. Go ahead, Charlotte. Sure. Hi, Blaze. This is Charlotte. Um, hey, I Charlotte. Was, hey, um, I guess uh, my question is, can you comment a little bit on the role of the, the diagnostic newer radiologists now that like rapid and FIDS and all that are, you know, are able to basically be DTAs and CTP and all that. Um, how do you think the role of a diagnostic newer radiologist might have changed? Or what do you actually like talk to them or how, how do you, uh, do you, how's your interaction with them? In this area. Yeah, so you know these technologies are, are obviously not you know implemented in every system, and where I think you know uh, I, so in in all of the um, more the you know the diagnostic uh, you know sort of utilization of AI, I would say uh, you know it it certainly hasn't replaced you know um, you know diagnostic neuroradiology that kind of thing. It's it's more a very helpful adjunct. So in other words, all this stuff needs to be red is normal over red what it does do is it, it, it kind of takes the the time pressure for the read you know off right so decision making can right. happen like in other words you know at, at two in the morning at some small network hospital that would never have a diagnostic radiologist a neuroradiologist on staff you know like the patient could go in everything got to be protocolized hey just you know scan the patient this way beam it to the you know the, the cloud get your answer, so to speak. But but I really think uh, still for the organization of all that information, oversight, you know, how you, um, you know, um, you know, set up your network, all that kind of stuff very much still needs, um, you know, the humans, um, you know, so, so I think it's us utilizing technology to improve our efficiencies, but not to replace, you know, is currently where I see it. Well, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Good to talk to you. Yeah, good to talk to you too. Um, and Dr. Baxter, this is Ray. Hey, Ray. Th thank you so much for um, the presentation. It, my question is actually really similar to Charlotte's. Um, I was wondering what, uh, obviously this is all very, very new and we don't know, we can't really predict the future, but um, I was wondering your thoughts on uh, the interactions with the neurosurgeons. Yeah, from from uh, how the AI impacts that. Yes. And yeah, and then from uh, robotics, as in robots doing the procedure. Yeah, and also in um, given the uh, given the radiology oversight over this process, and that it it sounds like radiology 
is might have more of a grasp because now it's yeah. um most of the decision point is in sorry it is in radiology yeah I, i'd say you know so so i think um you know one of the things uh that a lot of these technologies you know were, was actually addressing was really um you, you know like a, you, you guys are all in training places and you know kind of bigger uh, programs where you know you had luxury of, of layers of you know you've got you know residents obviously you know kind of reading stuff you know kind of real time almost 24 7 you've got you know uh, fellows you get you know you know all, all of that built in but in a lot of programs that don't have you know that aren't big training programs you know they're relying obviously on on you know kind of okay you know for like again for decision making stroke patient comes in we're trying to aim for these, you know, kind of uh, get a patient, you know, from door to the angio table in, in 60, 70 minutes. Um, you know, that's almost impossible at, like I said, three in the morning, you know, if, if you don't, you know, like the decision makers are often obviously, you know, kind of the neurologist that might be looking at all that imaging, um, you know, and, and so, uh, or, or, you know, endovascular neurosurgeons who are trying to make decisions on whether, you know, take that patient to the cath lab, you know, so you're, you're, you know, getting a lot of, I would say, you know, people that, that their, you know, their bread and butter is, is not, you know, kind of the, you know, looking at, you know, kind of, you know, subtle M2 occlusions or M3 occlusions, you know, you know, there's, this, so, so, so all of this technology, you know, like was, was meant in a way to help um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, say, you know, eyes, you know, kind of get an answer very quickly that maybe not, you know, kind of the, you know, full bore, you know, you know, diagnostic neuroradiology, you know, you know, people. So, so, so definitely, you know, I think, I think it's helped, you know, you know, for, you know, neurosurgery, stuff like that, they, they see it as, you know, kind of something that, that can help them get to that decision. The, the thing that uh, helps radiology still is always, I, I feel we have a very good, you know, there, there are pitfalls with it, all of this technology. You know, it's not perfect. It's good, but it's not perfect. So, so having that background coming from radiology, you can really feel like you have a much more, you know, better handle on, you know, kind of making sure it is a true positive, you know, kind of, you know, what is the pitfall? What could be, you know, so, so, so I think you still, you know, that background still um, is extremely helpful in sorting this stuff out. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. I believe Jacob Fleming has a question. Hey, Jacob. Let's see, he wrote it on the questions here. He oh, said, uh, okay. thank you for taking the time to give this excellent presentation. One area of NIR that seems somewhat subjective is the TICI score. Is there any role for software to assist in the more objective determination for pre and post intervention uh, TICI scores? Yeah, I think I think that's been thought of. So even like the automated aspects, I think anything that, um, you know, he's exactly right, it's, it's a, uh, you know, I jokingly say I never give myself a, a, a ticky three because you know you're 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 never perfect, but but you know if you really look at it, it's like okay, this is subtle little, but yeah, but there there is a huge variation, and when things go to core labs, you know, uh, the the, uh, the the operators always are a little bit more uh, generous in their in their scoring than than uh, kind of what you see at core lab level, but yeah, but but automating, so those are all things that are perfect for AI, obviously, you know, things that can be you know, kind of just built in and the computer can learn, um, you know, through uh, basically repetition, get better, more accurate, more sensitive. Um, you know, that's that's the kind of stuff that can really um, you know, be put to AI and be, you know, perform uh, almost, you know, better than, than we do in a lot of ways because, you know, it's not, it's not uh, you know, dependent on maybe how, how much of a rush we're in, different factors that, that we kind of, you know, we, you know, like I said, humans are good, but we, we fall uh, prey sometimes to all the different distractions, et cetera, that, that, that the, the computer can be pretty reliable. And, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it does need human eyes, you know, but it's, but it's uh, you know, a very, very, like I said, reliable way to get you dialed in 
on uh, you know kind of okay you know here's where it looks so to speak so so um, so yeah so so I think that yeah that that's a good application for it, the ticky scoring. Great, thank you. All right, next let's go with um, I think Gasan had a had a question. Gasan, you can unmute yourself now. Let's see what did he say. He said, what are some of the technologies, uh, what are some of the new technologies within the biplane and Angio? So new technologies in biplane? Yeah, so, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of obviously, um, you know, kind of uh, software applications that come in. I think one of the things that's important for stroke work and that, um, uh, you know, uh, the angio uh, vendors have been, um, you know, sort of looking at and trying to figure out the utility of would be, um, you know, whether or not so we can now acquire that perfusion, you know, kind of information so we can get, you know, obviously great CT imaging on the angio table. And we can get, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, good perfusion information. So, so that's been something that's been thought about: is how does it impact the workflow? In other words, should you bring a suspected large vessel occlusion patient uh, instead of, you know, kind of, you know, putting them somewhere maybe else in the hospital to get all that CT imaging? And the team assembles there. Then you take the patient from CT back to ER. That eats up time. And you got to transport them. You know, hey, they are a candidate. You got to take them from ER up to Angio, do you just go direct to Angio? You know, so that's that that software um, is good. In other words, the Angio perfusion capabilities are definitely there. Uh, the issue is more, um, you know, you would probably take a large num number of false positives, you know, to Angio. So that's probably not where you want to really do all the vetting of these people is or else you would be, you know, kind of uh, calling in the engine <laughs> team and wrapping all that up, you, you know. So, so, so people are trying to figure out, um, you know, the like I said, the the capabilities are there, but they're trying to figure out a little bit of the uh, utility rather than just the capability. But, but, uh, but yeah, the engine tables are. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, um, you know kind of very high-end, uh, sophisticated technology, as you as you guys know, that's that's going into the engine units now. All right. We have another question from uh, Andrew Coe. He says, hi, Dr. Baxter. Thank you for your presentation. It might be a basic question, but uh, how are they visualized on imaging and any thoughts on how AI can help identify who has the bad versus good collaterals? Yeah, that's a good. Um, so really, um, you know, the, uh, the, the multi-phase CTA has been sort of, uh, you know, what we've used. We want to kind of look at, uh, you know, collaterals and score them. And so, um, uh, you know, that, that's, that's been helpful. Obviously, most of us are, are familiar, you know, kind of looking at those delayed, you know, the delayed MIP imaging, and, and you kind of get a, even a better aspect score when you look at that. But, um, but AI, you know, to, to my knowledge, uh, AI has not been used yet, you know, in conjunction with the multi-phase, you know, CTA to kind of do, if you like, a, uh, you know, an automated, um, you know, collateral score, but certainly that's something that, you know, could be um, pretty easily done as well. All right, looks like we got a question from uh, Ryan Morrison. Go ahead, Ryan. Hi, Dr. Baxter. Um, my name is Ryan Morrison, and I just wanted to say thanks for putting this on. Um, I'm a first year medical student with a background in engineering and AI, so I, I love this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And I thought this was a really cool application of AI to augment radiologist jobs instead of trying to like replace them to kind of speed up patient care. Um, my question is, I have two questions. Are these algorithms that you were talking about, are they FDA approved or cleared or are they just in clinical trials right now? And then uh, are there significant costs for the hospitals for implementing these systems? Yeah, so FDA cleared, they have, uh, say, both Viz and, and uh, Rapid uh, have gone through FDA and have, have cleared uh, them. Big pool? What's that? Okay, yeah, and then and then the second part of your question was, uh, remind me, it was, 
about the cost savings? Yeah, that and also just the cost to the hospitals to implement these systems. Yeah, so that, that's a bit of a factor that, you know, you, so, um, you know, as you know, I mean, hospitals look very much at, okay, I mean, we have to even do a subscription, that type of thing, you know, that there's no, um, you know, direct reimbursement that they get offset for that cost. You know, what they... Uh, you know, where the huge, huge cost savings come in, in a way, I'll just take, um, you know, like our stroke program. You know, we grew this huge stroke program. Uh, we were getting, you know, patients, you know, coming in from 50, 60 hospitals in this network. And our motto was really um, beyond, you know, kind of, um, you know, accept all patients, you know, never go on divert. And so we just basically said, hey, you know, you, you, know, you think this patient's having a stroke, send them to us, we'll figure it all out. And so, you know, we'd be flying those people there with helicopters, doing all that. But you're flying you know, for, for, you know, uh, the one true positive, you're probably bringing in eight or nine, you know, kind of people that don't need to be at that treating facility. And so, so the better recognition of the true positive is a huge uh, cost saving to networks because you could, you know, only crank up the resources that you need. Uh, to use if it's, if it's somebody that you're really, really going to treat. And then the other thing is, is that, you know, um, there's lots of people that, you know, clinically, and these are the active trial things right now, like the low stroke scale score people. So someone, you know, has some stroke symptoms, they normalize, oh, hey, was it just a TIA? But there's an element about 13% of, you know, kind of um, uh, true positive large vessel occlusions can have a stroke scale score of, you know, less than five and, you know, even, you know, down to zero, um, you know, so, so based on the strength of collaterals and you know, kind of what the blood pressure is doing, driving that pressure head. So again, for hospitals, uh, but they usually do exhaust those collaterals and need to be treated. So identifying them accurately, um, you know, is, is something that, that benefits and drives to the bottom line of hospitals, you know, not missing, so to speak, the opportunity to, um, to uh, treat a patient because the thrombectomy uh, code does significantly, you know, tie to a, a good reimbursement for hospitals. So, so the sell, so to speak, for these technologies has to be in improving, you know, the the true positive recognition and having more people have access that are the true positives to treatment. Great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. We'll go with uh, Suheb and Fatim, and then not go after. So, Fatim, go ahead. Um, why don't hey. we? We'll go to Nai. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Baxter. I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah. So, the okay. question for you is: um, Do you think the um, potential benefits of decreased door to revascularization time um, by implementing these robotic assisted um, endovascular technologies that you talked about um, through like more precise catheter wire manipulations would be minimized or potentially even negated by um, the time spent setting up these rather complex systems? Yeah, no, I, I think so. I think, you know, that's, that's a bit of the, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the way that people are, are sort of trying to sort through, you know, what is the map of, you know, where do you put the robotic, you know, assisted stuff, you know, like, like you know, where, what, what's the, if you like, you know, kind of the, the, you know, if you can get someone to, you know, a treatment center where there's, you know, kind of high volume, you know, work going on versus, uh, you know, sort of the efficiencies of getting the robot, you know, kind of tweaked and, and, and tuned. But my prediction would be that uh, we'll see, um, you know, robotic stuff being performed uh, kind of within networks that, that uh, I think the efficiency gained over, you know, getting someone treated at, their, at the point of first contact is going to be bigger than, um, you know, kind of getting to, uh, you know, a, a mothership, you know, kind of treatment center in a lot of areas. Because uh, you know the door and door out times um, are significant. They 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 add in significant delays, and the clinical outcomes really decline 
you know, with those delays. So, so I think, um, you know, like I said, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but I think that the, um, you know, we will see that, uh, you know, in preference, it would be to put probably some robotic stuff in areas than try to work on the door and road times. All right, I can read Suib's question. So he said, what are your thoughts on bringing patients straight to the angio suite if the pretest for stroke is high enough? Couldn't we perform a CTA in the angio suite? So we absolutely can. And this is something that's been looked at. I looked at um, uh, in our system years ago. And, uh, you know, if we were, you know, not using um, a fairly decent, you know, preclinical tool um, to screen patients, uh, we would take uh, 17 patients to the to the angio table to find one true positive, right? So, so you would overwhelm uh, if you bring in some of these stroke uh, screening scores that are large vessel, you know, kind of specific, you know, things like race is working on. We were kind of working on a tool back in that day. And uh, you can get that down to probably, you know, bringing three patients to find the one true positive, um, you know, but uh, certainly, uh, just from a workflow, I, I think, you know, mothership presentation, it probably still makes more sense to take the patient to a CT scanner and have the team assemble there, like neurology, decision makers, that's what we did, you know, get them to CT, whether in CT, you know, that's maybe where they're getting TPA, and then make your decision and go to angio. Uh, where I think the direct to angio has a good role right now is in the um, patients coming in that you know are from these network hospitals that are referred to you for treatment, and so those patients have been identified as a true positive, you know, kind of in the uh, outlying hospital. And really, you know, the only thing that you worry about more is okay, hey, say it was a two-hour transfer time, is this patient, you know, they're 85, is there still you know viable penumbral tissue that, that if we recanalize this, we're going to confer benefit to this patient. So you want to make sure that things aren't all a done deal. So kind of doing a you know, quick perfusion uh, real time on the table would be helpful rather than sending them to CT, eating up that time, you know, waiting for transport to get them to angio, but just bring them direct to angio, do the CT there. And if they got TPA, I mean, you could, you know, it's probably not worth it to toss in the CTA just to confirm that they're, you know, kind of still large vessel occlusion because most of the patients, you know, that that would recanalize, you know, would show a, a dramatic symptomatic improvement. But but uh, but I think the CT perfusion is helpful to to vet those patients that come in as a referral. All right, that seems to be all the questions we have. If anyone has any last second questions, raise your hand. Otherwise, Dr. Baxter, thank you so much for the presentation. It was great, and thank you for answering those questions. Yeah, my, my pleasure. You guys were great, so uh, so thanks. And, and like I said, uh, uh, AI is coming our way, so <laughs> for sure. I hope, I hope you guys, we got some people with some backgrounds in AI, so this is good. So so help, help us all with, uh, with kind of, like I said, the, the next steps, okay? Right, and for everyone listening, uh, this will be on the SIR RFS YouTube channel. We usually have it uploaded within a few days after. Perfect. All right, guys. Have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Baxter. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Thanks, guys. Take care. Ahmed? Yeah, man. Hey, just wanted to say thank you for your help setting this up. Hey, no problem at all, man. Anytime you need us, we're here. All right. Yeah, appreciate you. Take care. Take care.